stop. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. And uh, welcome to this lecture. And I think uh, I should start right from so from the, the, the previous uh, uh, lecture. So where we basically when we left with so last last time I was I only managed to introduce just a bit uh, to uh, the topic and uh, uh, what the time I'm interested in and and uh, why it's difficult for neuroscience cognitive neuroscience to, to, to study time. So but really what is the range of interest? Uh, what what is the process we are interested in and why it is important to to study. And now today, I hope to be able to go in deep into this uh, uh, neuroscience of time. And I will start really, um, we are still in this introductory bit. Eh? I'm not, I uh, haven't started yet the, um, the, the modeling and uh, the empirical uh, uh, evidences uh, that I will bring in favor of against uh, all these models that I'm presenting. We're still in this introductory bit where today I hope I will tell you about the task. So how do we study actually? So what are the, the tasks we use to uh, 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 investigating time perception, duration perception, uh, and what is the variable we measure and what are the properties uh, of uh, duration perception? In, in what if there is any so any general uh, property that uh, um, species uh, and and tasks share okay so perception one of the really uh, common tasks uh, uh, we use is depicted in a very schematic way in the slide that you have uh, that is here so you it's this is called a two force two interval forced choice task and it's basically what you do, you present the subject with two different um, sensory uh, information that uh, let's say two sounds or two visual images. And those images have, you present it in sequence. You have first, you present the, the first duration. So uh, the sound that has a duration T and then after a variable amount of time, you present a second um, duration that is t plus or minus a delta t and then uh, you ask the subjects to compare so you said okay which one of the two uh, sounds that you just uh, heard uh, was longer according to you and then the subject press a key uh, normally you you it has the possibility of choosing one of two one of two response keys. So if first was longer, you press one key, and if second was longer, second key. And uh, in some uh, circumstances, you provide feedback to the subject. So you just tell the person uh, whether it was correct or wrong. Of course, uh, using or not the feedback has an impact on what you do, right? So uh, there are certain, in certain experiments, you want to the subjects to learn and to improve by using the feedback in some subjects in some cases you don't want to have this uh, uh, interference with the feedback so the subject does the task uh, without really knowing if it's performing good or not and uh, um, what i would like you to, what i like to stress here is that there are so in, in this, uh, what we call, this is a trial, okay? And when you run an experiment, you, you use multiple trials because you want to sort of uh, average then out the, 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 the performance of your subject, right? Because uh, you need a lot of, uh, you know, uh, you need numbers, you need a lot of observations uh, in order to have a reliable, uh, uh, to perform reliable statistics on, 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 <clears throat> On the subject's performance and also because you want to get rid of the normal variability that you have in behavior right so in, let's say in one trial the subject was a little bit distracted in the second trial it was drowsy in the third trial it was there was some ex environmental noise that uh, uh, interfere with the with the perception of uh, what you were supposed to attend. So there are lots of uh, uncontrolled so variables that 
uh, uh, might have influenced the subject's behavior. And you want to get rid of it by just repeating, by collecting data, lots of data, in order to then have a reliable uh, measure of what the, the performance of this person was, okay? So you do this multiple times. And uh, what I also would like to, 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 to stress is that uh, each of these moments in the trial has, um, requ has a certain requirement for the subject, okay? So has a specific task for the subject. Let's, let's try to, to dissect this. So in the first place, so the subject has to seize something or hear something. And uh, he has to extract the temporal information from this uh, uh, sensory event, okay? So this is, let's say, we call it the encoding of the temporal information, the extraction of temporal information. That's the only job he has to do the subject. Oh, and, uh, um, and while you encode, while you extract this temporal information, you need it to store it somewhere Right. So, and it's possible that, of course, while you're encoding, you just keep it in this working memory, we call it. So it's like a short term memory where you just store, it's a temporary storage of this information. Then the second stimulus appears. So you have stored the past information. Then you have a new information coming. So uh, you again extract temporal information from this second stimulus you have to keep it memory as well and once the second information has elapsed the second duration has elapsed what you do you retrieve from your from your memory from your storage space the previous information you do a comparison between so because your task is to 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 compare them so you have to compare the two stimuli and make a decision and then um, uh, express your decision by uh, responding with a key press. Okay, so there are, from the cognitive point of view, there are different things happening uh, uh, during this uh, single uh, trial. Uh, if you want, for example, let's, uh, as you can, as you can see, right? So while uh, I'm appreciating the second stimulus uh, and I have to retrieve from memory, past information, making a decision, responding, preparing to respond. So there are lots of uh, cognitive things uh, on, right? So if you want to get rid of all this, uh, um, let's say interfering information. So if you are not in, let's, let's imagine that you are just interested in the encoding of the temporal information and you don't want, you want to get rid of the confound of uh, uh, memory storage, memory retri retrieval, um, com comparison, decision. You just, you can have an, a different type of task. You can get rid of one of the stimuli so you, you get rid of the memory load in the whole experiment and run an experiment where you have for each single trial, a single interval. So basically uh, you just present a single interval in, any, in every trial and you ask the subject to compare this uh, um, single interval with single duration, better, uh, with uh, a reference that you built up over time. So uh, this uh, reference, uh, which is like, let's say in, in a storage that it's more stable, it's a long-term memory, you can ask the subject to build in while doing the experiment, or you can provide this uh, template duration before um, starting the experiment, right? So you have a um, sort of training phase where you just uh, present this person with a sound of, 200 milliseconds repeatedly. So beep, beep, beep. So the subject get acquainted with this duration. And then in the proper task, in the proper test, you just present duration that either longer or shorter than this template the subject has in his head, okay? And, and in this way, you get rid of the memory load that he has to really, that the memory yeah, load in every trial. And, and it's just a single, uh, you, you focus more on the encoding rather than all this uh, uh, memory uh, aspect of the task. I give you an example, okay. This is what we, I presented yesterday, right? So this is an example where you have two stimuli 
to care about, right? So the first and the second decide which one was longer. And in this case, was the second was longer. This is, uh, again, uh, um, an example, but with, with the, yeah? Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so, um, so this task, uh, uh, so the subject already knows what is the task uh, before it starts, right? You, you have a phase of a familiarization. So before yeah. starting really the testing phase, you show and you explain what they have supposed yeah. to do. Yes, yes. So, but say, how is this representative uh, to how people behave uh, when they do not know in advance what is the task? I mean, performing the same task, uh, but they don't know it in advance. I, I, so they learn it. Right, my, I yeah. think uh, so. They they can learn it, and for example, this template can be built over time. No, right, no, of you course, can. Of course, it uh, can. But uh, I'm asking, how different uh, is the initial stage uh, of the performance of individual with the steady would, state performance? It would be very different, uh, and you can you you have to run a totally different analysis. You have to because normally you are you tend to. And this is something we don't do frequently. It would be like uh, using this Bayesian approach, for example, uh, and try to see whether, how does it change your performance over time? You have to do that. You have to consider the trials over time and see how your performance changes according to the fact that the subject is building up expectation and it's making a statistics of the environment, right? Mm -hmm. So he has to sample this information. And for example, something that you will see later. So if I present the subject with a bunch of durations, the subject performance tends to, after a certain amount of time tends to, um, to collapse towards the mean. <laughs> so it's a sort of, uh, if I ask you to, if I present you with 200, 400, 600, 800 milliseconds, your performance and you ask you, okay, reproduce this. But I'm not, I'm saying, I'm not presenting this duration all at once, but trial by trial. So the subject basically is building a template and it's building a statistics of what is basically the range of duration I'm dealing with. And in order to optimize the behavior, it relies a lot on, on prior knowledge, you know? So it builds a prior, which is basically probably the mean of the sample that is handling. And it tends to converge to this mean of the distribution. So he's be, so he tends to perceive what, the incoming information as more similar to the average rather than it actually is. And this is an important concept because the brain doesn't doesn't take just the simple. It doesn't take passively snapshot of the world around us. The brain makes statistics of the environment. And uh, what, this, the, what you perceive, what I, each of us perceive, it's really the result of this, this uh, um, statistical approach to the environment. So yeah. what I, the incoming sensory info, so, and this now, this was something relatively new, Matteo. So before uh, uh, we tend to have really to, to, to consider every single trial as a, distinct uh, uh, as an isolated element and we just analyze how the, the, the subject behave and how the brain gets this information independently from what was previously presented and what was previously done by the subject. Now this approach uh, of seeing things more dynamically and so consider your perception and your behavior in light of what you saw before and what you did before, what you perceived before, it's a new approach. So this contextual effect, and has been, and we, now we start, so there are lots of studies that study this contextual effect, we call it. Mm -hmm. So you build statistics, spatial and also temporal statistics of the world, and this influences your behavior. Yeah, no, that's been interesting, thank you. Yeah. yeah, and uh, but normally what you do in a more classical approach, you don't look at these uh, trials over time. You just uh, uh, took a snapshot of the subject performance by looking at the median or the mean of the performance over trial. 
okay? Unless you're interested in learning, then learning studies normally compare how was your performance before the learning, after learning, they, they do this, all this yeah, sort no, of thing. My question was essentially uh, exactly on this point. So what is the cognitive load uh, of uh, paying attention to a particular stimuli? And yeah. if, uh, if it is heavy, then uh, the selection on what you perceive and what you don't perceive uh, must Yeah, be. can change, yeah. absolutely can change. It can change a lot, can vary a lot, and you can measure it. This is uh, because you can measure how your performance, uh, how you, you behave in trial N and look at N minus one mm -hmm. and N minus one and you go back in trials and see how much your performance has been influenced by what was, pre was presented to you uh, uh, minus uh, five trials before on according to what was your performance five trial before. Of, of course, the influence is very strong for what you did before, much more than, of course, the, 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 the backwards you go, the less is the impact of what um, uh, on the current trial. Yeah, but that's interesting, sure. And uh, another, uh, yeah, yeah. Or, yeah, uh, just wanted to know if, if there is any dependence on the frequencies, how do we cancel them? The frequencies of what? Uh, like when we play two different sounds, and uh, the answers might differ on 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 the frequencies. The you, you mean the frequency of the pitch, so the frequency of the sound, or the frequency of so how close in time are, are the two stimuli? No, 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 the, the frequency of the actual time. I, sorry, actual sound. The pitch. Yeah, you normally, yeah. for example, if you, okay, sure. And this is something that we, we, you can manipulate. You can see how, if, if, if this is your in, experimental question, you can vary the pitch of the sounds and see uh, you have some condition in which uh, uh, the pitch is X and some condition where the pitch is Y, it's something different. Mm -hmm. But you normally, and so if this is your manipulate, your experimental manipulation, you should, uh, control that and have different trials. And normally you have a, an equal number of observation for each frequency you want to test. Okay, if you have a specific hypothesis, you know, I don't know, that the, the higher the pitch, the longer the time, mm -hmm. okay? Or the lower the pitch. But this is actually has been studied and I will show data on, on, uh, on this, uh, especially on uh, moving uh, motion or anyway, frequency of, mm -hmm of the motion in, 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 in of, the, of moving dots of clouds of dots but normally if you're not interested in these manipulations so you don't want to change uh, you're not interested in understanding uh, what's the impact of a sensory feature of your stimulus on time perception you just keep the sensory features equal across all your trials so you want really to control so you want to manipulate only the variable of interest, then in this case uh, is only time, okay? Yeah. You don't, you're not interested in manipulating sensory features, so the features should be constant across trials, shouldn't, shouldn't vary. Yeah. So Thank you. uh, you're welcome. And there are two um, also ways you can, uh, um, you can uh, uh, explore time. And this comes to a question that someone yesterday asked or something that we said at the really end of the talk. So you can uh, measure time as a field duration. So uh, like uh, you present something on the screen and uh, has an onset, stays there for a certain amount of time and has an offset, or you can measure uh, empty intervals. So a time, an empty time between two, two flashes. Okay, so in this case, uh, you minimize the impact of the sensory information, but you ask the subject just to judge the empty time between two events, which are often two flashes. I'll give you an example with this, okay? Um, excuse me, excuse me. I couldn't understand the difference between feedback and response. Okay, the, 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 the response is the subject has to just decide. He has two, two keys on the keyboard or a keypad. 
there are two buttons and they have to, to say which one was, so for in every trial, after seeing those two stimuli, which one was longer? And he has to press one, either one of the two keys, uh, according to whether he judges the second as longer or shorter than the first one. The feedback uh, is something that appears on the screen. It could be that, you see this cross here? Maybe a feedback is when this cross on the screen gets red after you respond, you, you know if your response was correct or incorrect. So if it was incorrect, uh, the cross turns red. If it was correct, it turns green, okay? Oh. Okay, so, so this is a feedback. So you, you tell them what they, how was their performance, okay? But this has an impact, okay? Giving a feedback or not giving a feedback has an impact on your behavior. You learn quickly, of course, with feedback. I see. But even, but even without you, you manage very well to do. I, I will show you an example of this two forced choice interval. I, what I haven't done, okay. It's very brief. I don't know if you, if you manage to see it, I will show it again. Which one was longer? You have to judge really the, the empty uh, time between the flashes. <laughs> Do you know which one was longer? I, I'll show it again. I think the second was longer, <laughs> but now I'm overtrained. <laughs> uh, subject. So here an example, no? for example, you can use a, a T of 200 milliseconds. And the com so the T is, we call it the standard duration. So the duration that you keep constant across trials. No? Uh, and this, the, 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 the comparison duration is the duration that varies, okay? And it could be uh, shorter, like could be 50 milliseconds, uh, 100 milliseconds, or 150 milliseconds, or longer. So it could be 250, 300, or 350, okay? So this is the range, for example, uh, uh, it's a, a, a pretty narrow, but this is actually something that the subject can discriminate, okay? So this is what you manipulate. You just keep one fixed and you change the other, okay? But of course, you have to make sure that the subject cannot respond to the task by just seeing the first stimulus, okay? That's why you want to make the second stimulus either longer or shorter, because otherwise subject, you, you see, if, if the second is always longer, it's always shorter, you, of course, you, subject can easily then perform the task without paying attention to the two stimuli. And um, an example of field duration, it's this one, where you don't have intervals, empty intervals. So you don't have these four flashes, but you have just two bright disks displayed on the screen, okay? Which one was longer? It's really hard to tell. <laughs> I think it was the first one. The first. Uh, first. I, I think uh, people easily, I mean, okay, we tested, I, I mean, personally, I work, we work with young students. Uh, so we, we don't uh, test uh, uh, aging people. So we really work with, in, a, in a young range. And some of the subjects, when they come, they really say, oh, no, this, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do this. It's too difficult. But in the end, after a couple of trials, they really can do it very well, okay? So, um, okay, this is a single interval, so it's the same, ah, okay. This is a different task. So here you have different, here you change, for example, this is an experiment where what you manipulate, it's not just the time, but it's also the spatial position of the duration in the visual field. 
But this is a, an example of single interval, it's very quick. Uh, so basically the subject has for every uh, flashing uh, uh, disk, he has to decide whether the, the duration of this disk was longer or shorter than a, a previously uh, acquired template. This is something we tested already, something that we are doing for fMRI, but this will go later because it's a complicated experiment where we try to bind space and time. Okay, but this is for me just to tell you, okay, let's try to see it again and see if you can see the difference in duration between, okay. This is more quick, quickly, quick, yeah. This was definitely longer than the first. I think, yeah, you can appreciate this one. subtle differences between, but this is a single interval. Eh? So every so every time the, the, the stimulus flashes on the screen is a different trial. So you are supposed to give an answer. So now the, the, this, the video goes on and on, but you are supposed to, to give an answer each time the stimulus appears. Oh, sorry, I just didn't want to, I wasn't meant to, okay. So what you measure, it's, uh, um, what you measure here, what, okay, this is a, a way we sort of look at the data. So what you have in the uh, y-axis is the percentage, uh, so the number of times the subject um, respond longer, so that judge, so, so when he has to compare the two stimuli, it, it, it said longer, he said, or she said longer, okay? So percentage of longer. So this is the percept of the subject and on the x-axis you have the, the physical duration really, okay? So the physical uh, time. And uh, the, the dots are really the, 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 the mean of the subject performance, for example, and what you do, you just fit uh, 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 a function, okay, so a logistic function. And then what you measure is, there are two things you can measure. The one, uh, you can, you measure the accuracy. So you measure, for example, uh, uh, basically uh, when, how, so what is the value of the physical stimulus that leads to uh, um, 50% accuracy. So which is basically 50% means being a chance if you have, if you have two possibilities, right? Uh, and this is called point of subjective equality, which is, sorry, uh, which is really a measure of a bias. So because uh, it tells you when, so which value needs to have the physical stimulus for you to be judged equally either longer or shorter. So it's the point where you judge the two durations uh, uh, the same, okay? And if you have, a, a, if, if for some reason you have a distortion of time, this point of subjective equality should be shifted towards the left or towards the right, okay? Because it means that something, so if it, if it let's say this red point is here, then it means that something that, has, that was presented for uh, less than 200 milliseconds, you judge it as if it was equal to 200 milliseconds. So it means that you, uh, your, your perceived duration, you, uh, you, you have a temporal uh, overestimation of, uh, of the duration. No? Because remember, sorry, here I didn't say something important, that your standard stimulus, so the stimulus that never changes is 200 milliseconds. No? And you have durations that are either shorter or longer to that. Okay, So if at the point of subjective equality shifted uh, towards the right, then it means that something that it's uh, 250, for example, millisecond, that is physically longer, has been perceived as if it was equal to 200 milliseconds. So then it means that your, your, per, you, you, your duration has been, so your perception has shrinked. Okay, so you, 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 you tend to underestimate time. So it's a measure of accuracy, a measure of bias. But then you can use another measure, which is called the just noticeable difference, which is basically the difference between 75 and 50% accuracy. 
And this just noticeable difference, uh, it's a measure of how precise is your temporal system. So what is the, the, the minimum difference between the two stimuli in order for you to reach 75% of accuracy? Okay, it's a measure more of sensitivity. And the two things can be um, basically dissociable, no? So that you can dissociate the two things. So the J and D, it's basically the steepness of this curve. The, 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 yeah, the flatter, so it means that you are, you, the, the less precise you are. Whereas you can have a curve that is equally steep, so your J and D is good, but you have the, the curve is just shifted in one direction. And in this case, you can have a bias in one or the other direction. So it means that you're, 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 you're sensitive enough to duration, but you systematically judge for some reason the duration to be either longer or shorter than they physically are. Um, those tasks that I presented to you are really on the perceptual side because what you need to do is just to perceptually match two stimuli, okay? But uh, there are tasks uh, that are more in, that have a stronger motor component. Do you remember yesterday I, I mentioned you this, uh, I, I gave the example of the language, no? So the fact that uh, um, in language is very important, the poses are important, no? So for how long a certain syllable is pronounced for. And that's in a case where time, you need, to, you need to perceive time accurately, but you also need to produce time accurately when you make a movement. And uh, that's why we also tend to measure the accuracy of, of your motor timing system uh, in the lab. And we do it with, like, with the task that we call reproduction of time. Um, and I show you an example of this. So what you I just briefly described. So what you do, you present a subject first, a stimulus. So there is still a, a perceptual component in the task because you have to extract temporal information in what you, per, in what you see or what you hear. And then you have to translate this temporal information into a precise motor action. So you have to reproduce the duration that you just perceived. So by pressing a key, for example, holding the key down and release the key when the key press that you made has had this, the same duration of the, 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 of the duration that you just perceived, okay? So in this sense, you do a translation of uh, a, a percept into, you translate a perception into a motor action, but it has, a, you know, it has a temporal component in it. So, okay, this is a duration. Then you have a go, okay. The burst of white noise, it's a go signal for you to start a reproduction. This is the second trial. So, what you have to reproduce is the duration of the first beep, the, the tone, the pure tone, very brief. So with, the, with, your, with your finger, you just press and release, okay? Um, um, in, and of course, so here you have really to rely, the only, you have to rely on your um, proprioceptive, we call it. Uh, 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 information. So you have to, the only information is just the, the sensation that you have by pressing the key down, holding it and releasing it. So that's the only feedback you have to reproduce. But subject can do that. And we, we have, we, I will show you data on that. So this is really a, a, a reproduction task. Another, uh, um, yeah, I can show you. Yeah, that, that's an, okay. These are schematically are two different types of reproduction where the degrees of timing, motor timing is different. In the first case is what I just described to you. So you have, uh, rather than a sound, you have uh, this square on the screen. Then after a variable amount of time, you have a queue. In this case is the word now that appears on the screen. And then what you are, are being asked is just to press a key, hold the key down and release it 
when you think that the duration that you reproduce matched the duration that you just saw. In this case, uh, when the subject presses, you give an, an extra information. So because there is something appearing on the screen, and when you release the key, immediately the, uh, the, the information disappears. So in this case, you have uh, an extra information that helps you out with the task. In the second um, uh, example, you still have first a, a, a duration to appreciate, and then you have a second stimulus on the screen. The second stimulus, uh, it's in principle, stays there forever. What you have to do, you have to press the key to stop the second duration in order to, and you, 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 you stop when you think that the two duration match in time. Okay, so this is a, it's a slightly, there is no translation somehow, but just a very precise motor moment, motor act, sorry. Here is like tennis, eating the ball at the right time. So you want to stop the presentation of the second stimulus when you think it matches your perception, the, the perception of the previous duration. Uh, yeah, and what you see, Echo Matteo, so if you look at what you see is that what you measure is, uh, okay, sorry, I'll just go gradually. Uh, 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 okay, so what you measure in this case is uh, uh, the reproduction of the duration. So for how long the subject press uh, the key, okay? So, and what you do, you just normally, uh, in this case, the subject had to reproduce two durations, 300 and uh, 1.2 seconds, okay? And uh, what you do, you, sub, you, you just take uh, the, 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 the time the subject pressed the key, you subtract it from the physical duration, okay? So and this means that zero means that you, perfect, you are a perfect clock, so that the performance was perfect. All the positive values means that you press more than you should have. Negative values, you, you, it means that you press less time so that you underestimate time, okay? And um, uh, what happens is this, so that you tend to uh, press more, so you overestimate the shorter duration and you underestimate the longer duration. Don't care, so the, don't pay attention to the different colors of the bus, this is something irrelevant for now. It's just uh, there are different co experimental conditions, but I don't want to go into it because it's too much of detail at this level. It's just a, a, just a, what I want you to appreciate is that uh, you have okay in the y-axis the accuracy measure according to this index, and you have the different experimental condition in the x-axis. So the physical time was 300 or uh, 1.2 seconds. So you have overestimation for short and underestimation for long. And this is the same if I plot, uh, this is a different experiment where I have this objective duration on the x-axis. So here I ask subjects to, in certain blocks of trial, I ask them to reproduce 300, something that it's uh, 400 and something in 600 in certain blocks of trials. In other blocks, they have to reproduce 600 one second, 1.2. And here is the subjective duration, okay? So if the subject is a perfect clock, their performance should lie on this diagonal, okay? So all, so, and uh, the, they, their bias is measured. So how you measure how distant they are from reality, from this uh, uh, diagonal. And also here, you can appreciate that they tend to, overestimate, so here the a bit, the shorter, 400 and uh, 300, here it's, uh, and they tend to be more veridical for 600. The same it's here. So you have 600 is a little bit more underestimated here. Here it's uh, more or less uh, veridical and here you tend to underestimate duration. So this is the famous, uh, convergence to the mean of the distribution. So Excuse the subject, me. yeah. Can you uh, tell what is the difference between blue and the red curve? curve? Okay, are two different. So 
the blue and the red are two distinct uh, experimental blocks. So subject performs, for, so subject is asked to reproduce duration in two different temporal contexts. In one case, they handle uh, 300, 450, and 650. So, and they do this, uh, they, they, they do this task uh, for, let's say, 70, 70, 70 times, okay? And then you just, you stop with this and you ask them to do the same type of task, but this time the range that they have to reproduce is slightly bigger. So the shorter duration of the range is 600 milliseconds. The intermediate range in this case is uh, a bit more than 800 and uh, uh, or 800, I think, and the longest is 1.2 seconds. So the task is exactly the same. It's just uh, the range they are handling is different. Thanks. So, and this is, uh, is uh, it tells uh, what I was telling you before that the subjects, uh, so the perception of the subjects uh, is driven by the context, uh, okay? So there is a big influence of the context and the subjects tend to converge to the mean of the distribution uh, they are handling in these different blocks. Because, okay, I observe these two points. These two points are the same physical duration. So you give, you, you ask the subject to reproduce 650 milliseconds, but you ask to reproduce this duration in two different contexts. In one case, the range is small uh, and, and it has a, a, a smaller mean value. In another case, it's a bigger range. And the subject perceived the same physical duration as different because the context has changed. This is something that to follow up of Matteo's question and my answer that the perception, it's not something uh, um, frozen and static, but it really depends on what you perceive before, okay? It's really influenced by the context in which, uh, um, uh, in which you're, you, are, you, are, you are perceiving things. So the environment matters and the, the brain builds statistics of the environment. And the way we perceive is influenced uh, by that. Okay, and this is uh, just the same, uh, it's the performance uh, of the same experiment, but this time uh, it's, uh, it's uh, rather, here the subject ha had a feedback. So they hear a sound and when they produce the sound, they hear a second sound. So they have a cue that helped them to reproduce duration. And indeed, if you appreciate, they really tend, although they have these uh, subtle biases, they tend to be closer to the, to the, to the, the perfect clock. Whereas if uh, you don't provide any feedback to the subject, so you do what I show you before, so with the, the sounds that you just start, you, 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 you hear a sound, beep, you have, a cue and you just have to press all the key down and release without any other help apart from the sensation of your key press, you tend to be less close to the to, to, to reality. So you're, you're very, you're more distant from this uh, uh, ideal clock, okay? But even though, you, and so, and generally what it's, this graph is telling me is the subject overall tend to overestimate more so they tend to press more than these physical durations are. But if you look at relative differences, so if you look at the differences between the different points, you still see that the pattern is exactly as it was before. So you tend to have this regression, we call it, to the mean and this context effect. But this was a sort of digression from what was my goal was to show you the tasks and how we measure the performance. And something that I want to, to tell you about uh, the performance of the subject. So there is something that it's uh, always there, no matter uh, the task you use to measure duration perception. 
no matter the sub no matter the subjects you are doing your experiment with so no matter if you're using animals or if you're animal animal that are not humans or human animals you tend to see the same pattern and this pattern is called scarlet property so it means that uh, basically that if you this is exactly what i show you in the reproduction okay this is the the, the you show something that lasts eight seconds and you ask uh, uh, participants to press a key for eight seconds okay or for 20 seconds so this is an experiment that works with much longer range uh, um, that I'm, I'm, I'm normally work with so it's a very it's a multi-seconds range of time but still uh, the task is the same and so and uh, if you basically plot the performance so the plot the, the, the time the subject presses uh, and this is uh, over time. And you see basically that on average subjects is very close to the reality of the target. So eight seconds in this case, 20 seconds in this case. And then if you look at the, the variance, so the variability uh, on a trial by trial basis, you see there is a certain variability, no? But in this variability, it's greater, you see, the, the width of the Gaussian uh, curve, it's uh, wider for 21 seconds rather than eight seconds. So basically, uh, uh, this means that, and if you basically normalize the two curves, so if you divide everything by the target interval that you are using, uh, you basically can superimpose the two Gaussian. So because uh, this tells you that the 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 temp, the variability of your temporal performance scales with time it follows weber's law we said a special case of weber's law and this is something very typical uh, uh, even if you are so uh, um, if i'm asking to you to judge the the pitch of two sounds okay or the weight uh, of uh, two objects uh, so a lot of, uh, this is a sort of feature that is uh, in your sensory system and it's, uh, it's there uh, no matter the, the type of judgments you have to make. So that really your, um, your, the, your ability to discriminate a certain things uh, changes uh, with the, the range you are really, uh, um, that you are handling. So if you have to discriminate, um, uh, uh, one kilos uh, with two kilos, you feel the difference. But if uh, you have to, to, to say the difference between, between 20 kilos and 21 kilos, it's still one kilos difference, but you are less, you, are, you will be worse in discriminating this one kilo difference if uh, you have to, uh, if the target is 20 kilos. And it's the same for time, right? So uh, uh, um, your variance scales with really target interval that you, that you have to handle. Um, and uh, this is uh, an example, uh, still the same uh, super, so the, the, the same curves. And this is, for, for example, this is uh, uh, taken from a study that uh, studies uh, aging people and people that have um, uh, Parkinson disease, that uh, is a disease that causes you um, uh, problems in motor coordinations and is often linked uh, to deficits in your dopaminergic system in specific uh, brain uh, areas in your uh, especially in, um, in 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 structures of the brain that use dopamine as a neurotransmitter and those are often subcortical regions like the basal ganglia but even prefrontal cortex and this is basically uh, the, 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 um, the, the, the performance with patients that are on DOPA, so where they they are, they're taking dopamine, and this is when they are off DOPA, so when they basically don't take uh, these dopaminergic drugs, and basically, as you see, the scalar properties doesn't hold anymore, so the, 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 the behavior, it's much uh, doesn't fall uh, the, the Weber laws uh, as it should be in normal uh, uh, people and this is just according to these people just to prove the importance of the dopaminergic system 
to uh, the, the capacity of telling time, okay, the temporal precision. And now I'm showing something similar in animals, right, to show that even animals show the scalar property. So this is exactly the same reproduction task that I showed you before. But this, uh, it's monkeys who have to do that, okay? Monkeys are, of course, have, have, are trained for a month to do this task. And here is a, we will see in detail this experiment uh, in the following lectures. And basically here, the monkey is trained to associate different cues, like, uh, um, uh, so different colors, okay? So red and blue with different durations. In one case is 800 milliseconds, in other cases a second, okay? And the shape of the cue, so whether it is a, a square or a triangle, they have to use uh, different effectors, so different body parts to, to give an answer, so to reproduce time. In one case, they have to make a saccade, so meaning they have to move their eyes to a target. And in, uh, in other case, they have to really key press, they have to really use a, a lever to uh, their they finger to press and to reproduce the duration. In their case, the reproduction, so basically there is something flashing on the screen. So but the important thing is this bit. So basically they have to, um, so they have to get ready to, to perform. This is the trial in, in initiation. Then there is something flashing on the screen that in case of, uh, they have to make, a, that tells the monkey where is the target of the eye movement. And then uh, this is uh, really the time they have to produce. So this, the, the monkey has to hold the response. So differently from what I said to you before. So here they don't have to press, hold and release. Here they have to refrain from, move, from moving and for a certain amount of time. In case the, the queue was red, they have to wait at least 800 milliseconds before making the eye movements, if uh, it was an eye movement trial, or they have to wait 800 milliseconds before uh, um, do a key press, if it was red, or a second uh, and a half, if it was blue, the queue. And so they, how they, do they learn? They learn through reward, basically. So they, are, they get reward only if they waiting, uh, it's the waiting time before making a movement, it's uh, as if it is supposed to be, right? And so they learn to do this and I can see, you see now, this is really the production interval of the monkey. So you see on the Y axis is really the, the production. And this is uh, uh, the number of trial they basically they, uh, they, 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 they perform. So you see and each dot is a trial. So it's actual response. And if you see here summarized uh, the distribution of their responses, in blue is the longer range, in red is the short, is to 800. And you see, you know how, uh, so the, it's greater the variability in the longer range rather than the short range. You see, and these are the first, our top is one monkey, uh, uh, bottom row is a second monkey. Monkey studies, of course, they record from a limited number of, of, of animals, right? Uh, it's just two. Uh, in uh, cognitive neuroscientists uh, use a, a greater number of, uh, of subjects because then we, we run statistics on, on, on the group, okay? So we sample, uh, it depends what type of experiments uh, you are, um, you are performing, but normally if you just measure behavior and you don't record any brain signal, you need at least 20 people, uh, even 25, 30, 40 even, okay? Of course, uh, the greater uh, is the sample, uh, uh, the, the more representative, of course, of the population uh, is what you, what you see, okay? So you can make your, you know, you're more confident in making some assumptions that refers to the population from which the sample is, is taken, okay? So if I'm sampling young, I can say something, I can make inferences about the, 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 the young uh, aging, uh, the young, uh, exactly, uh, the perception of time in the, in the younger uh, people. But I think I'm, uh, it's, uh, I'm supposed to stop now, right? Yeah. So I have a question. Uh, uh... Yeah. 
what is the i mean what is the origin of this color property or let let me so ah, sí. does it has uh, to do with the fact that uh, um uh, i mean the the, the information uh, uh information limits essentially in the storage capacity of uh say how how many bits you can use to to do this ta task and then how you should use most efficiently these bits yeah well uh, it must come from uh, uh the limit the limitations of your yeah of your of your sensory systems no the 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 grain that your your sensory system can handle right so because if you you yeah i think it's what you said is more or less uh, could be the case that this is um, the reason why but it is uh, since it's so common across uh, um uh, sensory feature is not just something typical about time it's something that even if you have to estimate the length of a segment you no know, you have to judge uh, uh, if something is uh, is a uh, half uh, uh, a centimeter or a centimeter and a half it's the same so again for pitch uh, it's probably due to really the, the 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 limitations of our of our of the incoming of the information you can handle at once it must be like, like, like something of that sort but i don't know i'm not aware if someone has it must be some some someone who has uh, tried to answer these questions but it's interesting. I can I can browse and check if someone has studied that the origin of the scalp. But any model that mm. uh, uh, wants to try to explain uh, how time works in the brain has to face this uh, issue of. Uh, being able to replicate the scalar property, although the scalar property, okay, the scalar property is very is taken as a very general rule, you know, uh, that holds across across uh, um, across tasks, across speeches. But indeed, if you go in deep and look at the literature, you realize that, for example, it doesn't hold for durations that are below um, Matteo, below below the the 100 milliseconds. So already, if you under 50 milliseconds, this doesn't hold, or durations that are above two seconds, or um, the, 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 the scalar properties sort of start failing. It's not so obvious, okay? Because the scalar property is taken as a proof sometimes of the fact that the clock is universal. Okay, but indeed the failure of the scalar properties, uh, on the other hand, are taken as a proof that okay, listen, but this might not be so universal this law, and so let's say depending on the sensory modality you are using, uh, the, the the you we will see. I will present some experiments that tested that. He uses different tasks, some more motor, some more uh, perceptual, different sensory modalities, signal from sensory modalities. And it founds out, it, basically this study found out that the scalar property varies indeed, if you change the properties also of the stimuli. So, so what I can imagine that, that uh, say, if, uh, if you have, a, if you look at longer time scales, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, if it fails because your distribution has more features, let's say, then, then, then it is because that when, when you have a longer time duration, you use more uh, information or more bits. You have less limited uh, in the capacity, and you engage a different system as well, Matteo. Because if you have to under twenty seconds, uh, you know it's the mechanism that you probably be use is different. So you you engage a lot of memory. There is a huge memory load for you compared to to half a second uh, right or 200 milliseconds that's totally from the cognitive point of view you probably engage different resources mm -hmm. less attention so the, the the smaller range is more into the automatic uh, you probably do it more automatically without really uh, devoting resources like attention that it's limited this is has been proved uh, also memory capacity are limited so I think this is what we are going to see in the next lectures. No? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, in the next lectures. Uh. So other uh, questions for Domenica?
you can write to me if you have as yesterday some uh, the question is uh, in, the, in the chat is uh, what is the take home message uh, is it scalar property of time perception yeah well the take home message is in in most of the cases yes Yes, the, the scalar properties is a property of time perception, but we should bear in mind that there are cases where the scalar property is not uh, always uh, 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 respected exactly. So, and this depends, uh, we will see tomorrow from the sensory modality and the task at hand can change this. But um, in general, yeah, it's for most of the cases it works. Yes, so if uh, there are no other questions. Uh... I have a question, yes. Professor. Yeah. yeah, you were saying in the two AFC, two intervals, and then the two AFC, single interval, and you are trying to avoid the use of working memory, right? Yeah, yeah, sure, working but memory, yeah. At the same time, you have a template you have to build, so that is based on memory as well. So. The role of memory in uh, time perception, I think, is like of fundamental use. And what are the studies on this? If you have any reference, yeah, there are. I mean, there are. Of course, memory is very important for time perception. Um, in, in that case, uh, you in the single case, in the single interval, you reduce a lot the working memory. But uh, uh, but not the, but you have this uh, long term memory on the other hand no but the load of the income so of you don't have to handle all this uh, uh, first second compare so it's reduced but you cannot avoid it right also because uh, it's intrinsic in the time right you can't um, uh, if you are interested in reading a classic book of uh, nearest cognitive uh, of co about cognition and human cognition um, uh, uh, and um, uh, William James, uh, uh, which is the brother of Henry James, by the way, uh, wrote a, a seminal book on, on, uh, on in, in, in the, uh, on, on, on the cognitive neuroscience and even uh, uh, in the last, last century, uh, so he basically was able to say that you don't, without memory, we don't have time, no? So because of course, uh, working memory, so if you have to integrate information over time, there is somehow uh, a form of memory, like an, uh, even if it's not exactly working memory, it's an iconic memory, it's a sensory memory, it's a very low level memory that you have to engage. So this is true, it's, uh, uh, and the role of memory depends on the range as we were saying with Matteo um, a few uh, minutes ago, uh, that the longer the range, the more uh, the engagement of, uh, of, uh, of uh, memory. Um, it's very difficult though to dissociate memory from, uh, so when you encode the stimulus, it's very difficult to dissociate the moment where you extract from the moment where you just uh, hold where integrates over time this information. So it's not clear. So there are a lot of studies that, uh, for example, so one way to study would be to look at, um, at the time that is between the two stimuli and see what's going on, for example, while you are holding, while there is nothing on the screen and you're just holding the previous information and are waiting for the second one. Uh, I did some studies on that, and, but if you want, I can, uh, if you write me on the, chat, I can give you some, some uh, uh, references, but it's, bear in mind that it's not so obvious to dissociate time from memory, especially at this short range. If we talk about, uh, um, you know, episodes like temp mental time travel uh, and stuff that are more related to um, uh, putting in sequence events, right? Uh, if you watch a movie, you know, there are some studies that you, you, they make you watch a movie and then they scramble the, the temporal sequence of the scenes that you, you saw. And then what do your task is to put things in order. In that case, there is a lot of episodic memory and it's still time because you have to build a time sequence. You have to remember what came first and what came later. And in that case, the role of the, 
the, the medial cortices, uh, the hippocampus, all the, the system that deals with memory, it's uh, more uh, um, important. But what I want to, and I think this is a, a message that you will hear from me multiple times. What is emerging with the research in this field is that um, it's uh, really a, a dream to find an area that does just time. The absolute modularity of cognitive function is a dream. It's very uh, you know, convenient for scientists to think, oh, this bits of the brain does just that, that bits of the brain does just that. It's often it's never the case. And especially with time, because you use time to act in the world. So for your motor action, you use for perception. So, and what is emerging is that depending on the, the, the task that you have to perform, then you engage a circuit that can tell time. So if I have to do attention to time, I use attention on circuits. If I have to, uh, I need memory and a precise temporal aspect in the memory, then I use the memory circuits. So it's really very not so modular time in the brain, okay? But according to the function, you can, you can engage that network. You can uh, uh, use that for, uh, for, um, for telling time. But this, is, this lack of modularity is something that it's also more and more popular in, in general in, in cognition. So thank you very much. much. Hello. Hello. Uh, yeah. So uh, memory affects the uh, perception, right? So how do we define memory? So what is memory or how the brain actually stores memory? So, if, so say if I want to store something in the physical world, like I can store money in my wallet. So money, so how brain stores memories? I, so what's the concept? <laughs> Wow, so you treat me as, a, as if I was an handbook of neuroscience. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm glad, no, I'm, I'm laughing because it's an important question, of course, it's, uh, but it's, there is a huge field of research about uh, how the brain uh, deals with memory. Uh, we had a Nobel Prize uh, uh, that, uh, so Edward Moser, who uses, uh, who studied a lot, uh, the hippocampus, so we know a lot. We know that there are different types of memory that some, as I said, some it's a memory that it, you use for really slow level. You just for, it's an iconic memory uh, that it's very sensory, but there are, you know, this working memory with temporary storage. There is a, a, a long-term memory. It's a semantic memory where you, you store your concepts. So this is, there is an entire field of research uh, on, uh, on that it's not an easy answer to give to you, but it uh, has been extensively studied though, so we know more or less. Uh, we, we learn to, this, to sort of uh, dissect, so to uh, sort of uh, uh, partitioning out the problem. So we know that there are these, these different functions and for each of this type of memory, that we have, we know that more or less there are parts of the brain that are interested in each of these uh, uh, um, memory functions. Yeah, thanks. So professor, do you mind if I ask one question? Yeah. Yeah. You so go ahead. In, uh, yeah. So in the figure on the uh, bottom right of the slide, the red dots and, I don't know, at the last page. Uh, yes, yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, so as you can see on the blue dots, which uh, is the trials with a higher amount of time, as you can see, the, the x-axis you wrote trial. And I assume that those numbers are the numbers of trials that you showed some stimulus, right? Yeah, if the so, monkey had. It's the, yeah. the whole so, session. It's 800, it's a huge amount of trials. Yes. So I assumed that uh, if we increase the number of trials, our brain tend to learn the stimuli and the actually the data points get nearer, nearer and nearer to the mean value. But your data points shows here that no matter how many 
times we show the trial, there's always a misinterpretation of time that our brains cannot perceive. And we always underestimate or overestimate if uh, the duration of showing a stimuli is longer than a, a particular amount of time. So we're not learning if, so our brain doesn't adapt itself to predict the correct time, but no matter how many trials we show. Yeah, but well, but it's, it, yeah, it's okay. This is just 800 of trial, but you can learn. So this is a, um, um, it's just, a, um, this is a measure of, of, of variability. But if you, if you, let's say, look at how, uh, if, if, for example, rather than, than uh, um, if I use a different task and uh, I measure, because this I can, I can, so here I ask the monkey just to do always 800 milliseconds, right? But if I imagine that uh, I, mm, I manage to, to, I ask a totally perceptual task. So I, I ask to discriminate between uh, 800 and, 800 and 900 milliseconds. And if by trained uh, humans do this, huh? in monkeys, I'm not aware that there are, but, but all studies are about learning, but it's a learning in different, um, they look at different aspects anyway. So if I train you for five hours on this task, uh, your ability to uh, discriminate, so this, uh, um, this uh, uh, 100 milliseconds for you become too uh, big. So not too big, so yeah, too big. So your performance uh, will reach, uh, 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 will become higher and higher. So whereas at the beginning, maybe your performance is around 70%, 75, then your performance increases. Or, and if I'm able to use, uh, to decrease this uh, um, gap between the two durations over time, you will manage to reach the same 80% accuracy, but the, 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 the distance between two the two stimuli becomes smaller. So indeed you can learn time. Now, so if I look at this, so if if I'm so if your question was whether we can learn time or not, because we no, do, saying, we have research on I'm that. Saying in this particular figure, there is no learning that we could. Well, uh, uh, if I may, so uh, I rephrase. Think this figure, the feedback uh, is whether uh, the stimulus was uh, longer or shorter. So there is no need for the animal to uh, to learn uh, more precisely than this. No, exactly. See, because uh, they have to, yeah, yeah, sure. They don't have to discriminate even. They have to just hold the, the response for a certain amount of time. Exactly. This is a correct. Uh, and uh, they get reward if uh, enough of the trial, if uh, they uh, are able to hold the response at least for 100, for 800 or, or 1.5 seconds. So meaning that basically uh, it's the precision they are they required is not huge, but if uh, you require to uh, have more precision, as I said in my example, uh, so that your task is really to discriminate between the, dur the duration between two stimuli and you get feedback and you are trained uh, for a certain amount of time, you learn. So the, your, your um, performance becomes better and you need less difference between the stimuli to have uh, a certain level of accuracy. So and you your suggest, brain changes. So you suggest for well. just, let's just say we have one stimuli and it's just asking uh, a person to estimate uh, 1.5 millisecond and hold the button. And if we provide a feedback for just one for just that uh, simple simile, we would see after uh, many trials that the that dots learn, actually okay. get nearer to the mean value. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. This could be, in the reproduction um, uh, context, I don't know a lot of works. Uh, I know a lot of work that studied learning in, the, in a more perceptual context. And for sure, in perceptual context, you learned. Yeah. and you are able to learn and your brain so change change changes 
uh, as a consequence of this learning as well. Thank okay. you. <clears throat> so I think we went uh, over. Uh... Over, <laughs> yeah. No, it's okay. It's uh, actually very uh, stimulating. It's very refreshing to give talks yes, in this it, context. Well, because it brings, uh, <laughs> it brings a lot of questions. You just, it baffles you how things happen that <laughs> you just but also for me, also for me, it's very, <laughs> yeah. very interesting. Yeah, thank you, guys. Okay, thank, so, you. thank you very much, Domenica. Grazie, so, Matteo. Thank you to you. Tomorrow, and we'll see you tomorrow. tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Bye. so, have a nice uh, day, evening, uh, or night. Ciao. You too, guys. See you tomorrow. Ciao. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Ciao. Thank you.